one who will have all things must first give them up. God wants to be ours exclusively. The more things we keep for ourselves, the less we have God's love. The less we own things, the more we shall own God and God's creation. The hunter-warrior is a relentless strategist. In every moment and in each life episode, she calculates. She sizes up the given. She seizes its inner meaning. She grasps its relation to every other moment, and in this awareness, she forges her own creative intent. And then she lets go. She does her deed and surrenders herself within it. She freely offers it to history without question or regret. This control and abandonment, at one and the same time, define her very mode of being. A cat falls out of a tree, becomes completely relaxed. It is the philosophy of the Tao that the moment we were born, we were kicked off a precipice and we're falling, and there is nothing that can stop it. So instead of living in a state of chronic tension and clinging to all sorts of things that are actually falling with us because the whole world is impermanent, be like a cat. When things inevitably do their thing, right? We're always falling. <laughs> then you can enjoy the ride. You also can give other people a lot more freedom and space to be who they are. And then it's much nicer to be around you <laughs> when you're not defining people as one moment in their life. Or even a whole collective. Seeing ourselves as beloved is seeing how we belong to every other thing and that every other thing belongs to us and how do we want to be in a relationship of care to all those things. I have a friend who's a midwife or was a midwife and she talks about with women in labor shifting from the idea of a contraction which encourages the mind to tense up and bear down. And instead to think of it as a surge, actually it's not a contraction, it's, it's the uterus doing this. It's not going like this, it's actually trying to push the baby out. But thinking of it as a surge, and just even that difference in how you think about something, and how women then can experience that quite painful experience with more openness, with more spaciousness, and even enjoy this incredible process of giving birth. That's just one example that I find helpful in terms of if we meet the difficulties of our life with this contraction mindset, oh, it's gonna be painful, this could be terrible, and yes, it could be, but if we see the, the losses, the ways life just impacts us and pulls a rug out from under us as a surge, sometimes if I can't sleep, doing some kind of loving kindness practice that includes myself, but where I begin to wish others in my life well, wish people I don't know well, wish people that are difficult for me well, wish all beings well. Let's talk about the heart. When I put my hands over my heart in bed if I can't sleep and I'm just focusing on may everyone that I know that I don't know be happy, be healthy, may they have a good sleep. That helps me go back to sleep. It helps me to really relax because I'm knowing my connection with all of these. It's a non-self practice to see more and more that what happens to me is interconnected with everyone. What happens to them, it impacts me. And so caring about them, really intending for their well-being energetically, that's a heart practice that is a not-self practice. And when I can break out of this, oh, I can't sleep, and what's going to happen tomorrow, and how am I going to make it through the day, then I slip into this beloved 
place of, I can wish people well. I can wish myself well. I can stay connected to my heart. The heart is where all the worries and the fear resides also, so that fear transforms into love, into care, into compassion. So that's the disidentifying, right? Okay, here I am, and I don't need to make a story about this that is more painful. To be untroubled and pure, one thing is necessary, and that is disinterest. I put disinterest higher than love. God's habitat is purity and unity, which are due to disinterest. Therefore, God necessarily gives God to the disinterested heart. In the second place, I put disinterest above love because love compels me to suffer for God's sake, whereas disinterest makes me sensitive only to God. This ranks far above suffering for God or in God, for when one suffers, one pays some attention to the creature from which one's suffering comes, but being disinterested, one is quite detached from the creature. A disinterested person is sensitive to nothing but God. I put disinterest above humility. The disinterested person wants nothing. You may take this for the truth, that when a free mind is really disinterested, God is compelled to come into it, and if it could get along without contingent forms, it would then have all the properties of God. Of course, God cannot give God's properties away, and so God can do nothing for the disinterested mind except to give God to it and it is then caught up into timelessness, where transitory things no longer affect it. Then one has no experience of the physical order and is said to be dead to the world, since one has no appetite for any earthly thing. This is what St. Paul meant by saying, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. If one is to be like God, to the extent that any creature may resemble God, the likeness will come through disinterest, and one proceeds from purity to simplicity, and from simplicity to unchangeableness, and thus the likeness of God and the human comes about. It is an achievement of the grace that allures one away from temporal things and purges one of the transitory. Keep this in mind. To be full of things is to be empty of God, while to be empty of things is to be full of God. So I'm, I'm working with these students, and these students, the millennials that I'm finding, and this is uh, why I took the university track, because I knew that the real power of this religious tradition, see, the real power is not in the institutionalization of all of this. The real power is still in the rituals. It's still in the prayer traditions. It's still in the mystical traditions. It's still in the lives of the saints and the martyrs who engage us into a, a longing for God as a long and extended preparation for death so that even while we're alive, I say to my students, and this is going to be there, they, 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 I, I have them memorize little parables that I've made up. So one of them is that the life journey through, its, through, its, um, through all of the experiences, the heartbreak, the romance, the disappointment, the sickness, the weakness, the successes, the births, the joys, the ecstasies, all of them, are really, as Socrates even said, one long preparation for dying. And Christianity has as its centerpiece the, the death of the Lord. We say at, the, at, at our services, our rituals, when we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death. It's a long extended 
dying, and here's the, here's the parable I ask them to memorize, a little proverb. Die before you die, so that when you die, there's not much left of you to die, and then you can truly live until they bury you or cremate you. <laughs> and I had them memorize that. And, uh, and, and, and slowly these young students, which I have the pleasure of teaching, are understanding this because they're dying psychological deaths, many of them. A lot of their friends commit suicide or are on the verge of suicide. There's a lot of pain, but pain, and this is why I love teaching this, it's an opportunity without religious jargon and to help them understand that the human mechanisms of pain can become portals like those moments of entry and the veil can lift in those moments. But somehow, it, it, the, the students, and this is why I, I work with them on the interior life, uh, we practice some sort of, of, of quiet breathing to teach them a tradition that's not only in the Eastern religions, but in Christianity. We have the Jesus prayer, we have the contemplative Carmelites prayer. We have interiority. And without interiority, we do end up creating the idolatry of settling for life without enchantment. And, and, and so that's why when the bishop asked me, where do you want to go to school? I said, I'd like to go to Louvain so I could become a, a professor, teacher a teacher of these rituals, but more than the rituals, teacher of how these rituals unveil or are portals to this mystery of the mystery of, of, of a divine communion with the beloved that enravishes us. Like John Donne, you know John Donne in the Holy Sonnet number five, I believe, he says, for I neither holy nor chaste will be unless, O God, you ravish me. That great line. So this is part of this, uh, yes, sir. this is part of that reason I became a teacher, yes, to engage sir. them in that exploration of themselves. Because it's all here, you know. And even these bells, these bells um, that are ringing now from the bell tower of this church are a public declaration of the passing of time. And I spent uh, 10 days with Thich Nhat Hanh on a retreat with Martha Howard. She invited me to go on a Buddhist retreat at the seminary up in Mundelein in Illinois here. Up in Mundelein. <laughs> and we're 10 days in silence, eating in silence, listening to Dharma talks by, by, the, the, by the, the teacher every, every day, twice a day. And we meditated for hours, hours. And, uh, and it was a wonderful beginning for me to become aware of the fact that the interior life is what is essential for any legitimate ritual to come alive. The disinterested person, however, wants nothing and neither has anything of which to be rid. Therefore, one has no prayer or one prays only to be uniform with God. When disinterest reaches its apex, it will be unaware of its knowledge, it will not love its own love, and will be in the dark about its own light. Blessed are the pure in heart who leave everything to God now as they did before ever they existed. This race is precisely the flight from creatures to union with the uncreated. When one's essential reality achieves this, it loses its identity. It absorbs God and is reduced to nothing as the dawn at the rising of the sun. Nothing helps toward this end like disinterest. Disinterest is best of all, for by it the soul is unified, knowledge is made pure, the heart is kindled, the spirit wakened, the desires quickened, the virtues enhanced. 
non-duality for the Christian is to be guided by the spirit, not by the, one of the false selves or the ego. So you, you have to let go of that, but also you're freeing some of these virtues to start functioning in daily life. And, and the infused virtues are really the work of the spirit who spontaneously gets us to do what is right without even thinking about it. So that's where effort would be a mistake because the soul under the influence of the spirit that effortless total receptivity is the best way to be open to God's guidance. It's, it's like as uh, being a container for God. So uh, for a container to be filled, what's the best response? Emptiness, openness. It's very simple, but very hard to do. All you have to do is nothing. <laughs> Try it. But it doesn't mean you actually do nothing. It means that you're empty of all will uh, proposals, but open to God's action so that you do what he wants to do. Mm -hmm. Emptiness is not total nothingness, mm -hmm. but emptiness with an openness to becoming more. Mm -hmm. There is nothing to do, only to be infinitely still so God can have a chance. A frightful strain. There is only the wall, there is only God's face, there is only the cross. I neither negate or affirm anything. I drop off body and mind. I live on the ground of reality. I stop worrying. I settle more deeply into immeasurable reality. I keep this same posture through all mental conditions without being pulled this way or that. There is no good or bad Zen. There is no good or bad prayer. Zen is always Zen. Prayer is always prayer. I maintain contemplative Zen posture through all conditions. There is only the wall. There is only God's face. There is only the cross. I neither negate or affirm anything. I drop off body and mind. I live on the ground of reality. I stop worrying. I settle more deeply into immeasurable reality. I keep the same posture through all mental conditions without being pulled this way or that. There is no good or bad Zen. There is no good or bad prayer. Zen is always Zen. Prayer is always prayer. I maintain contemplative Zen posture through all conditions. Can I learn to do nothing? Can I continually practice letting go of my thoughts and my feelings and my stuff and all the realities that have claimed my attention for most of my life? Can I stop worrying can I actually settle more deeply into immeasurable reality? This dance of detachment is delivering me to some very deep interior space. Come practice this dance with me. What do you have to lose but everything? Let's dance over the absurd abyss.